the five best TED Talks to watch before you start this new decade. This is the Focus Group. It's the savvy side of nine to five. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> and learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is the Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. I didn't like it what it looked. Hey, welcome to the Focus Group and welcome to 2020. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host Tim Bennett. You can find us here on our video feed every Wednesday from 1 to 2 p.m. live on Facebook and YouTube. Focusgroupradio.com is our website, and that has all our media, video, audio, and uh, our other podcast called Unbutton, which you can get on Tuesdays. 20 minutes long, three topics. We'll call it punchy. It's punchy. It's fast and punchy. Just making the face like, I'm not sure if I like punchy. Punchy's good. So here we are, folks. Brand spanking new year, new decade. It feels clean. Everything feels clean. It's just all bright and new. You think? No, of course not. I, I, I walk around and anybody that even wants to hear me say it, I'm always like this. Oh, it's a brand shiny new year. Feels a lot like the old one. <laughs> the old one's just days away, hey, right? You're supposed to be positive. I'm positive. I'm sure positive. I want all positivity out of you. I have, in fact, over the, my resolution was to switch my, my motto. At owning businesses for many, many years, I've developed a motto and I think it's seeped into every corner of my life, and I don't know if it was a good one. And, it's, and I, the motto is, plan for the worst, hope for the best, which is based on Ben Franklin, originally said this. But Ben Franklin said, hope for the best, or hope for a good outcome, and make a plan in case things don't go right. So see how I switched that now? You know, plan for the worst is negative, 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 hope, hope for the, the best. best. Now you move it around and say, hope for a great outcome, make a plan in case it doesn't go well. <laughs> it, never, it never really goes as you think, right? So Exactly, exactly. That's a, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a good way. But I you know, I would like you to be a little more positive about things and you're happy and happy on Monday. Sometimes Mondays you're grumpy. I have also changed my Monday. I I'm, I'm now doing one of our tips we gave our audience last year is now I sit for quietly with a pad of paper and a on pencil. Monday or Sunday? Sunday night. I write down the things that I want to accomplish or that I'm supposed to get done. Not all in one day, but over the week. And then I take a highlighter and I say, I want to do this, 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 this on Monday. And boom, I feel better. <laughs> I wake up and I actually have things to do. And I'm... and So it's been eight days. Is it working? Yeah, so far, so good. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, it's not really been eight days since this Monday. It's been, you know, only two days since this Monday. But the last Monday was, yeah. <laughs> Did was you do okay? okay? I'm doing okay, yeah. Are you going to be... I, I don't know if I asked you this before. Are you going to be doing a ride this year? Oh, yeah, yeah. So a training for a ride. There's a couple options. My friend Linnea um, is going to visit an uncle in uh, Tucson, Arizona in February. Brand new house. She'll be there by herself with some friends that I know as well. And it's like a golfing, hiking, bike riding trip. I have to see if I want to do that. I've done bike riding in the Tucson area. It's pretty cool. Um, is that where you saw the mattress stores? Yes. Tucson, mattress stores, tire stores, and hearing aid batteries. Every corner. That was my impression, at least. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's all, there, that's all there is to say. And the trip I'm thinking of doing is uh, Girona, Spain. It's uh, north and east of Barcelona. It's like cycling paradise. A lot of teams train there. And you go, it's a ride camp, so you set up shop in one location and it's in you know they call it out and back rides every day so you have you come is it home. a week or is it a few seven, days i would do seven days so it's seven days is about five days of riding and the two other days they let you they encourage you to not ride because you don't want to be on the bike seven you days do a night well usually dinner is at five or six usually six group when i was dinner. in my Yorker. it's a group dinner and by eight everybody's tired you have a drink Oh, yeah, you could have cocktails and stuff, but most people crashed about 8.30 or 9, and then you're up at 6 in the morning to get ready for the next bike ride. So. You shower before you ride? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. That's, that's an odd question. Why, why would you? Because I know with rowers, you know, you shower after you row. You don't shower before you row. Ugh. I, I, bet, I bet a lot of those guys don't shower before they ride. Um, the professionals do, the pro teams, because I didn't realize this. When I watched the Tour de France here... It usually airs around 8 in the morning. Yeah. That's really noon or 1 p.m. their time. So they're, they they actually ride from noon to like 
five or six or 11 to something. So yeah, they're up early. They have, they shower, they put on their kit. They're in the team bus. They do their thing. But anyway, I'm thinking of doing that. And if I don't do that, then all the fallback would be to, to cobble something together out in Tucson area or something like that. I'm just surprised to hear that you shower before you go out. Do you shower before you go to the gym? Well, I, I go to the gym midday usually, so I am showered when I go to the gym, yeah. Now, if if the gym were close by... and uh, or, What if and you it, went to the gym at 6 a.m.? Oh, I wouldn't know. I would just go to the gym. All right, that's what I'm getting at. All right, so this morning, for example, I got up and I have my bike attached to a trainer now for the winter, and I, I can watch... Did you do that this morning? I did it this morning. I got up at uh, 6.30. I was on the trainer by 7.20. And I did a hour of what they call SST training, sweet spot training. So that's where I'm 90% of my functional threshold power output or 70. It varies. But you basically, you're a sweaty mess when you get off. Ugh. Then you shower and shave. What were you watching? It's, uh, I use something called Zwift. No, I said, what were you watching? Zwift. It's well, basically, watching basically it's CNN or something. No, it's like you in a video game, and the video game is London or Virginia or something called Watopia Island, and you basically are riding with other people, and they have flags over them, like here's Canada, Japan, US, US. How'd you do? I was just doing a personal training ride, so, so you I weren't riding with anybody. But yesterday I did a, a group ride, and I was consistently three out of forty people. So I was the top. I was one, two. I was the top guy. One of the top guys. Top guy. And by the way, even though it's a game, and I know that these people are in other parts of the world, it does get strangely competitive. Well, that's what it's supposed to do. Keep yes, it, and it keeps you moving. Because some guy kept coming up next to me, on the, and I'm like, and he had the, like a, I forget the nationality. It was, maybe it was Spain, uh, red, yellow, Germany, or... Uh, was it red, yellow, black? That's red, it, yeah. red, red, yellow. So it could have been Germany, could have been Belgium, depending okay. on which way the stripes are This going. guy keeps coming up, and his name is Rory, Rory something, Rory C, whatever, and he, he'd edge past me, and then I'd <laughs> go a little faster, and he'd drift back. There you go. He gave me a thumbs up. You can do that in the game. You could actually give people something called kudo, and a little thing floats above your head. So is it commutative? When you get back on again, it tells you where you've gone? Oh, you! It keeps all your mileage. Keeps your it it all yeah, in. yeah. Now the rowers do that too. There's. I was talking to somebody about that over the holidays, and the, the rowing is putting that into the. I guess into the programming as well. I'd be curious to know how that actually. So on a bike, you know, you have. I have my. I slide my computer monitor over, and it's not quite perfectly in front of me, but it's close enough, and I could look around and see, like today's ride. I did something called. Road to Ruins, R-U-I-N-S, and I'd never been on this route before, and you go through a jungle, and then suddenly you're in this, like, weird Maya city, and, and weird things happen that make me laugh, like a monkey ran across the road at one point, or swings from a tree, and you're like, what? And there, it's, it's gamey, you know, it's not, it's not bad rendering, but it, you know it, it's not real. So how would that work with rowing? I mean, the river's very... Could be a duck. In front of you, a log, branch. <laughs> but would you, bumping. would you, around a bridge. but does the scenery, like on cycling, scenery makes a difference? As you ride through an environment, you're absorbing it. But well, with rowing, you're not allowed to look out of the boat. You're just straight you're ahead, right? Off the balance, even just the weight of your head. So, really? Yeah, you just stay straight forward. Eyes in the boat, straight forward. Don't look out of the boat. So when you were doing you all your rowing events, you, were, you, you could be on the Charles. You could be. You would not necessarily know. You'd be reprimanded if you looked out, and at the end, the coach would get really aggravated if you looked out a lot. I remember we had one kid that looked out a lot. We were in a new area. He said, "Did you? He goes, did you get the surveyor's map done?" He was a geologist. The kid was a geologist, and he said, "You've mapped the whole river, up and back. You're not supposed to look out because you throw you throw the weight off." Even minute, even minutely. Yeah. You do that. The minute you do that, it takes more energy to keep the boat, right? I want to keep it steady. Yeah. So, yeah, you can look out. So how would that, so if you were doing this this kind of a video thing that I'm doing, basically you'd be just looking straight, straight ahead. ahead. And you do movements like, you know, it's that kind of movement. But together as a group. I, that's why I'm curious about it because I, I they do. Did, I they do offer it somebody. for? Yes, and I talked to somebody about what you were doing with the bike. And I said, do they have that for rowing? They said, oh, yes, they do. They, they said it's not as, they don't think it's as, certainly not as popular because fewer people row. Yeah. But so I, they, I, they said they're not sure it's as sophisticated as the cycling one, but they're trying to get there. 
I just think it would be good for somebody like myself or someone like you, particularly in the winter, if you wanted to keep oh my it competitive God. and keep it moving. And if you're, if I, I have no excuse to not. And by the way, like the ride I did this morning, uh, 55 minutes. It took me a good half hour for my heart rate to come back down to like non-sweaty normal. I don't even get that way on the bike when I ride outside, unless I was unless I'm riding with a group of people or a friend who's really pushing you. So I think this winter thing really is a smart. It was I, you know me. I have well. The good thing about being on the bike in the house is you actually have to pedal. Yeah. <laughs> I think when you're outside, half of it you're coasting. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. Right, there's, there's a, lot, a of lot of truth. You're going down a hill. You're it's going micro. Down. You break micro break micro break. Yeah, you could. It's a very so. It's a very different stressor on your body to do this kind of training. Yeah, that's good. What All else, right. What else is exciting? What, what are you looking at? You're looking at. I'm something. looking at my notes because I was going to ask you two questions. You have Netflix, right? Yeah. I've been hearing a lot of good things about Call Me Dolomite, Eddie Murphy's movie. Have you? But I heard from like four people over a course of like. Call me Dolomite. Call me Dolomite. It's basically. Have you guys heard of Call Me Dolomite? Has anybody watched it? I have. Everyone says it's really good. What do you think, I Steve? I liked it. It was pretty good. Someone said a friend of mine said it was like it was great Eddie Murphy, but it was also a charming story. Like the guy is is. Yeah, it wasn't as funny as I thought it would be, but it's still good to watch. Like it doesn't. It's not boring or anything. What's it's, the premise? Um, he's a comedian who's like doing shitty rooms he's sick of his so he starts doing like new material that he pulls off the street from bums like telling <laughs> stories and it gets him famous basically and he does a movie and it's shitty it's and Ru the movie the movie Rudy had Ray Moore's life right yeah yeah Rudy it's, Ray what's Moore. That? it's Rudy Ray Moore's life Rudy Dolomite oh. the, the, uh, the real guy, guy yeah. yeah yeah hmm so yeah, I thought story. it was going to be funnier, but it's actually like a good story. All right. So that, that's, by the way, that's Steve, if you're not watching the video. And we have Garrett on audio who chimed in as well. They're, they're the boys in the booth, according to our statistics, which Tim is diving deeply into. And we have right. Robbie Bobby in the booth as well. These people are more popular than you and I, who do all this work with the graphics and the notes. It's about the boys in the booth. We're getting a young audience. <laughs> We're reeling them in. <laughs> So the other thing that I've been told I must see, but it's only in theaters right now, is a South Korean movie called Parasite about this family. So someone starts working for this rich Korean family. Parasite. And then they're, so it's a, and eventually the entire family occupies positions of like chauffeur, cleaner, whatever. And then I heard there's a couple twists that I don't, they don't want, no one wanted to tell me, but there's more to the movie than that. But the friend who said this, that go see it, he said, you'll love it, but. It's dubbed. It's subtitled. I don't want to read. I'm not going to motivate. He said read. he goes. That's the problem he had with the movie. He said he goes. I know I shouldn't have this problem, but my eyes keep going back and forth from action to what do they just say, and you miss some of it, I guess. But you like reading movies? No, but you know, later on we're going to talk about the TED talks. I ended up reading along because they had the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I I will say that I saw a subtitled movie recently, and Who told you about that movie. Anyone I know? Oh oh, uh, no, no one. All right. But I've heard this from random folks about Parasite. Um, we watched a subtitled movie recently. We had to stop about twenty minutes in. They were speaking so quickly that I could not keep, keep up, up with, with the, the reading. And in fact, once I kept up with the reading, I wasn't paying any attention. To the action, and I think you know a lot of time and money goes into filming the action. Yeah, there right? was an, a there was a something I think on Netflix a couple of years ago that somebody recommended, and I, I got into it in about twenty minutes, shut it off. I think it was Israeli, something about the Mossad and the and the Palestinians. I forget the name of was it. it a you said it's documentary. No, it was a it was, it was a movie. movie. It was kind of like a homeland, but it was Israel and 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 the Palestinian conflict. It was called IDR. I forget the name of it, but I, I got tired of reading. I was like, I'm done. I'm out. As much as people said they loved it, I just same thing. I was. It was so fast the dialogue, and Do you I, know. And here's the thing I've been thinking about with that. When I was younger, I used to watch. I don't, I don't think I watched more subtitled films, but it somehow didn't bother me back then. I, I'm not. I'm not slower reading or watching. So maybe I've just grown to be less tolerant of that experience of this up and down thing. You're a quick reader. I can't. I. I have to actually sound every word out because of my the way I read so for me it's, it was a struggle oh yeah I could imagine if you know so. hey let's uh let's say hello to Billy um happy new year Billy uh, 
Happy New Year. Yes, the same as always it is. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Billy sent me a really great photograph of him and Edmund raising their glasses of champagne around New Year's, and the light catch, there's like little sparkles of light. It looked very festive. You guys looked very handsome, good-looking well, couple. So Happy New Year. You. Thank you. You know, I have that thing for LED lighting, so look out for me. <laughs> I hate this part. Bob is on the LED bandwagon like you wouldn't believe. Why? A, they've gotten really good. The, and they, you, they're cool to the touch. You never get burned by touching an LED bulb, and they're very energy efficient. Well, Trump says he's getting rid of them. Are, well, are he's, he's getting rid of keep the incandescent bulbs. Huh? Yeah. It makes you very orange. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys have a good New Year? Uh, it was just us. It was quiet and beacon and ambient lighting, and watched everything go on. And you know, I've been on the wounded list. I. I fell down the set of stairs for Christmas, so I've kind of been a little slow. Billy, what's going on? What happened? I'm getting me an old curmudgeon. I can't walk down icy stairs without falling. <laughs> well, I, I can't down. I, I, I think the minute you put the word ice into anything, uh, it's problematic, right? Uh, well, as, as my friends say, you're getting old. <laughs> no, I just think you had a mix, an accident. But did you? Are you bruised up, or are you doing okay? Oh God, yeah. I heard things crack. I said, "Well, I didn't hear anything break, but I heard things crack." And oh boy, man, yeah. oh man. Yeah, well, yeah. You gotta take care of yourself. It's a so, new year. Uh, yeah, Tim, they have a program for the rowing, for like you, you know, with bicycles and flying, you can do that with rowing too, huh? That's what uh, that's what I was told. I was down. We we have a at my boat club. We have a holiday dinner which is one of the few times I show up. <laughs> and, um, and I was talking about this, and that's why I asked John about the, the rowers. So, yeah, I, I, the, the, my guess is every sport will eventually have something like that, right? Because golf had the game. Oh, my God. Well, cycling is unique in that it's just the bike. Yeah. It's just well, you could kind of equate it to doing a Peloton kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, that's right. It's like it's like Peloton. Yeah. Um, so now you could take Peloton anywhere. You could run with it. You know, you could put it on your iPad. But normally, they want you to buy the expensive Peloton bike, etc. Well, you have to be a skinny girl to have it first. Oh, I love that whole kerfuffle over the holidays. I mean, boy, they must have gotten a lot of business out of that, right? Yeah. Well, I did a lot of Netflix since I've been laid up. I did the fabulous Miss Mais Mrs. Maisel. Watched that to the end. Did Lost in Space and boy. The Tick. Ah, uh, I'm all right. So I read a review about Lost in Space second season. Um, the critic said you'll enjoy it, but it's sort of forgettable. I don't know if that's true or not because we have yeah, watched. it kind of goes in a different direction. But that's what he said. He said it's they could have gone in any number of directions with the one they took it in. They weren't quite sure about. And then uh, the Tick, I've heard some really great things about. Did you like it? Yeah, it it, it had a cliffhanger ending too. You know. I know from a different genre when it was on before. It was written a little differently, but we watched it. We we finished the whole thing out, and then of course Mrs. Maisel. Well, that that had a very good ending. Billy, while we have you on the phone, and Tim, and the boys in the booth, do you guys know John Mulvaney, the comedian? Yeah, I know of him. I don't really. I don't okay. think okay. John this. Mulaney, like this. John. Oh, I'm sorry, John Mulaney. Okay, it's John yeah, Mulaney. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Bob and I were kind of like. Netflix is one of these things, I think, all, we all agree, there's just endless things, scrolling, scrolling. Well, I came, I was scrolling along, and I see this thing that you might be interested in, and it's called John Mulaney and the Sack Lunch Bunch. It's a children's musical comedy special created by John Mulaney that debuted at the end of the year last year. It's kind of a riff on Sesame Street, The Electric Company, and The Great Space Coaster, by the end of this one hour and four minute show, I, I cried, I, 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 had, I was tear stained from laughter. The, it's not consistently hilarious, but when it does go from four, it goes to 15. Like, it, it, and you, we, we had to pause this thing, and we, did we just hear this? Did they just sing that? Is it for adults? Yes, most certainly it's for adults. So, Billy, put this on your list. It's the John Mulaney and the Sack Lunch Bunch Sounds children's awesome. special. Bob went to work, mentioned it to some friends. This co-worker said, she goes, we were crying, we were laughing so hard. The sack Lunch Bunch. John, just look for John Mulaney, and you'll see the sack. And it's, it's, it's that sappy kids' special thing. However, 
we paused it at one point, and I said, is this as subversive as I think it is? Well, well Paul's got his show program, uh, coming up Friday, I believe. Who does? Uh, RuPaul on Netflix. Is it a comedy special? No. It's, he was on CBS this morning. I didn't quite catch what it was about, but it's much more serious and geared towards what his life is really like. Oh, really? So this is not his talk show that, that only went for a little bit and it's not being renewed. This is a this is like a RuPaul biopic or something, right? Yeah, it's, it's well made. We're, we're definitely going to catch that next time we're snowed in. Yeah. <laughs> <Right in. laughs> well, I know. You know, Billy, here's the deal. You've had this bad accident with the ice. Upstate, it's bone dry again. There's, I don't, you know, it went from that crazy doubleheader snowstorm to Thanksgiving, and now we're in, like, it's going to be, like, 50-some degrees on Saturday, right? Yeah, warm. Record yeah, it's, warm. It's, it's constantly ice, and it's like North Carolina winter. It's uh, <laughs> no fun. <laughs> Billy, that is so true. It's a North Carolina winter. I have to remember that. I was in Winston-Salem once doing a consulting job, and it was the winter, and they never really got snow, but they did get ice. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on with the show, my friend. Thank you for calling, and Happy New Year. Oh, happy See you, New Billy. Year. I'll catch your kids later. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, now it's time for Caught Your Eye, Tim. What caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. In my effort to continue to bash San Francisco. <laughs> Why? Well, it's not like you set out to do this. No, but this was the headline. But the headlines come up, yeah. The headline came up, and John and I have talked about San Francisco um, a lot, and I, I counted how many times I've been to the city since 1992, 91, 92, and probably over 50 trips. And I will say that um, it's gotten progressively worse. In my last trip to San Francisco, I could understand why this headline uh, says what it does. And um, although a lot of people, you know, it's a beautiful city, um, it does have its issues, and our president, of course, has made light of it with Nancy Pelosi. Now, this headline is estimated $64 million loss as San Francisco's poor street conditions drive high cost uh, events outside the city. So Oracle is the latest to leave. Um, Oracle is based in San Francisco, but they, they do a open roll conference, which hosts about 60,000 people. And for the first time in two decades, they're moving it to Las Vegas. And they said after the event, they, um, they had asked people what the issue was. So they, they had done a, um, a, feedback, um, a feedback study or a feedback survey with people that attended the event and said, how was the Oracle One World Conference or Open World Conference? And they said the attendee feedback was the hotel rates were too high. That's any big city in the U.S. Yeah, I agree. But they said the biggest issue were poor street conditions which made uh, were poor street conditions. They said it was a very difficult uh, decision for them to, to, to leave. They said that um, they're just not one of the, the latest. They said the doc, a doctor's group, the San Francisco uh, Medical Association, also pulled this convention in 2018. The doctor's group told San Francisco leadership that they loved the city, but the post-convention survey showed that members were afraid to walk amid the open drug use, threatening behavior, and mental illness that's common on the streets, along with the tent, uh, tent cities. And uh, last year they said a UC Berkeley researcher found that some parts of San Francisco were more unsanitary than many dwellings in improv- impoverished developing countries. They did a survey of 158 city blocks and they encountered more than 300 piles of human feces and 100 plus improperly discarded needles. So they said that uh, San Francisco really needs to get their act together. They said this is now taking a huge toll. They're going to lose $64 million just on hotel by Oracle moving the convention to Vegas. And those are just like room nights and, and people nights coming to the city. Nights, right. So 60,000 people. So they're moving this other medical convention and moved in 2018. They said they're expecting to lose more. But I will say, and I know I've gotten bashed online, but I will say it, um, the city should be ashamed of itself. Last time John and I were there, we were shocked. Walking it, around. It was an eye opener to I, me. And I said, yeah. I can't imagine if I came here from another country, and this was my first impression of the United States, or I came here from other parts of the United States. San Francisco is viewed as one of our most beautiful cities. It's gorgeous. It is a beautiful city, but the fact that they've allowed 
what is going on around the tourist areas is beyond me with these tent cities being accosted by people for money um, the open drug use the needle exchanges is to me it's just here's the, here's what crazy I'm... and my friends I'll say one thing my friends who live in San Francisco tell me it's my imagination not my imagination I've been there over it's 50 not your times. They, they've said it's your they said it's not that bad I said you don't see it now when you and I were there with with one of our clients she ordered an extra meal to give to the people on the streets she and and, and then she and, and by the way she did the same thing three months later in New York when we had dinner with her and she couldn't even give it away because yeah. now that's not to say that we don't have a, a bad homeless problem no. um, I don't even know you know just intellectually I don't even know where you begin to attack this problem and I am sure that the uh, the, leg the San Francisco legislature you know their elected officials are desperately trying to figure it out maybe it's been going on a long time. <sighs> It's been going on for quite a while. I mean, when I first started going there in 1990, 92, and then progressively, progressively, progressively. What was the, uh, what, what was the area that, that we stayed at that? Was it the Tenderloin, they call it? The Tenderloin, it? which was about four uh, That's blocks. always been. Always been rough. Yeah, yeah. But to walk in front of the Uber headquarters or the headquarters of... Twitter. Twitter and seeing these... Ten city. Ten cities out front. And, and I used to go run in the mornings, and I'd be accosted at 6 o'clock in the morning, people jumping out at me looking for money. I, and we had a unique experience on our last joint trip to San Francisco because we were test driving an electric vehicle for Volkswagen, and we couldn't plug the car anywhere in, but we could do it at the dealership. Yeah. And the dealer was actually about a 15-minute walk from where we stayed, and that went right through yeah. all the worst of it. And... Um, I don't know. I have talked to people who are resident, long-time residents, and they agree with you. That, but they, they themselves say, we just don't even know where you begin to tackle this problem. If you raise taxes even more, which they're insane. Well, there's too much disparity between the haves and have-nots. Have-nots, yeah. And the, the high-tech, I think the high-tech companies there, the Silicon Valley, need to step up. step up and start investing in the city and affordable housing and all the other issues. But because they said an average two-bedroom in San Francisco is thirty-six hundred dollars, just an okay average two-bedroom apartment to rent. To rent. So that's you know. So if you think about think about that, and the weather's nice generally. So if you're going to be homeless, great place to be homeless. Well, there was wasn't there. I don't know if it's urban legend or if it's truth, but L.A. used to give bus tickets to their homeless to literally ship them up yeah. to is that was that true they said that you know minneapolis or in minnesota and minneapolis and milwaukee would trade that they would say minneapolis would give, give you a one-way ticket to milwaukee because they knew that the social services in wisconsin better would be or, better yeah. or vice versa who knows whether that really happened but you, you know you move it along it is an issue um in philadelphia now they the, the the mayor is one another um re-election at the inauguration they're trying to figure out how to control the panhandling and the increased amount of people that if you go to a nice restaurant on in the areas of Philadelphia you don't want to leave and be accosted and feel bad about well, going that's the dinner. yeah yeah so but that happens in, in some of these cities but I, I just thought that San Francisco thing was uh, just something else again which was another black eye on the city that they need on to a beautiful city and I really yeah well well, mine is a, a very different caught my eye. You know, at the end of the year, we usually get a lot of in memoriams and a lot of tributes or, or those slideshows of everybody who's passed away, yeah. Yeah, Hollywood figures. And it actually is striking to me because in amongst that, there's usually a cluster of deaths that happen right around Christmas or New Year's. Um, and I read the other day in The Hollywood Reporter about the death of one of my favorite artists, a guy named Sid Mead, visionary conceptual artist behind Blade Runner and Tron. He died at the age of 86. Uh, Sid Mead was the self-proclaimed visual futurist and conceptual artist who shaped the look of Blade Runner, Aliens, and Tron, among other projects. He was 86, as I said earlier. So he drew these? He was hired by the studios to come up with, uh, like, on, if you're watching on our video feed, uh, we have a picture of Sid Mead, and next to him is a picture of a car he designed for the movie Blade Runner. It's called a Spinner. Across a wide-ranging, decades-long career, the visual futurist designed cars, worked on aliens, and two Japanese films. He was born in 1933 in St. Paul, Minnesota. He grew up um, in a fairly normal home. He went to he was in the military for a while, but then he went to the Art Center School in Los Angeles, now called the Art Center College of Design. He went on to design cars at the Ford Motor Company oh, wow. in their advanced styling studio for two decades or two years before he struck out on his own. Like a Taurus. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, he had car in his blood before. He started his own company, Sid Mead Inc., and from the 1970s through the 80s, he worked for Philips Electronics and created architectural renderings for companies including Intercontinental Hotels and Don Ghia. After his work caught the eye of Hollywood, though, Mead went on to produce conceptual artwork and other products on films, including 1979's Star Trek The Motion Picture, 82's Blade Runner, um, 1982's Tron, 86's Aliens, 84's Time Cop, 2000's Mission to Mars, 2006 Mission Impossible, uh, Elysium, he did Tomorrowland, and the recent Blade Runner 2049. Now here's something... That's not a picture of that. He's, he's... That's just, uh, that's one of his architectural renderings for like a future hotel or a future city. Now, the picture that I've included here in the video feed, what was notable about this not only I was a big, I'm a big Sid Mead fan in general from a conceptual, I just love the artwork he creates. But here's how I, I save this part for the last. Um, Mead died Monday at his home in Pasadena after a three year battle with lymphoma. His spouse and business partner, Roger Cervic, told The Hollywood Reporter, I had no idea he was gay. And the way they treated it was so his spouse it would be like you know is that him there with him he, Sid Mead's on the left in that kind of uh, paisley shirt and his partner his his spouse Roger Cervix on the right and I just thought wow this guy I've known this guy's work since I was in high school and he's been on all these big movies or he conceptualized stuff and to have that written that way you know as we his spouse informed us that he passed away I thought that was really cool so he, he was gay, and then he eventually, obviously, got married. So, very interesting. That is interesting, because I guess his pro personal life probably was never talked about. Never, ever, ever, no. And, and you know what? Why would it be? Yeah. He, when, he would, when he would go to conventions, or he was doing stuff for, um, you know, the studios, and or when he, go, when he did books, because he had beautiful art books that came out, too, when he did book signing tours and stuff like that, it would never be part of the... Uh, part of the thing yeah. you know so I, I thought that that's not only did his death catch my eye but the way they so beautifully put that in there in the third paragraph you know um, after a battle with his business his spouse and business partner Roger Cervic so very cool so we're gonna miss Sid Mead One Sid Mead gone he coined the term future or visual futurist which I like I often wonder why all that stuff's gray Oh, you mean like for renderings and stuff? Yeah, like Star Wars and Star Trek and all that stuff. Everything's gray. <laughs> like Battleship gray. Except the planet of Tatooine, which is orange and brown because it's desert. Right? Dune. So. Dune. If you want to just watch an orange movie. <laughs> Stuck you with know something? Seattle. They should put that on IMDb for the description of if you want to watch an orange orange, orange movie, movie tune in. That the one with Kyle MacLachlan, that terrible movie. Horrible movie. You know, De Laurent. Yeah, that that was that's a great. It's an amazing book. Very hard to turn into a movie, yeah. but business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. Happy. Today's January 8th. Uh, January 8th, 1904, Walter Dimer was born. He also died January 8th. Imagine he died on his birthday. 1998 at Isn't 94 that, years old. I wonder how often that's actually happened. Not I bet, enough, I bet I there's don't. a number of, I bet there's a stat for Check that. that out. He was an accountant who in 1928 invented bubble gum. Not just bubble gum. What's that, double bubble? Double bubble. So he worked for, he was an accountant, and he worked for the Fleer Corporation, F-L-E-E-R. And um, it says uh, in the bio here, it says, people have been chewing gum-like substances for fun for centuries. <laughs> but commercially produced uh, bubble gum was a problem because it didn't hold its flavor. It was too sticky. The texture was uh, too dense. And you couldn't blow bubbles. And if you did, it would get on your clothes and ruin them. <laughs> so this uh, Frank Fleer, who died in 1921, he was the founder of Fleer Corporation. But he dreamed of bubble gum and blowing blowing bubbles with with bubble gum or whatever and just could never get the 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 uh formula down right so dimer gets hired there as an accountant uh after this uh, frank fleer dies and they said although he had no experience with chemistry or confections or any of that sort of thing he was an accountant he would at lunchtime go down to the kitchens and play around with this formula 
And they said that by kind of doing the, his own little chemistry experience through trial and error, he found the missing ingredient for bubble gum, and it was a natural form of latex. So he said by whoa, adding whoa, whoa, whoa. a natural form, form of, of latex. latex. So he said by adding a little latex to the recipe, it allowed bubbles to expand smoothly and let the exploded bubble of gum be peeled off close easily in the skin. He discovered this in 1928, and uh, so Fleer, he, he made a hundred pieces of it on a saltwater taffy machine and brought it down to a mom and oh, pop. Oh, that's why it was the it t twirled on right, both, yeah. Brought it to a mom and pop candy store, and it all sold out in one day. It was one penny, sold a hundred pieces in one day. Do you know why it's pink? Is it, I, is it part of the, is it naturally pink, or did they? No, it was the only food coloring they had that day. <laughs> So most bubble gum's all pink. Can you imagine? I wonder what it would have been if it was. If the only color they had was blue or green. Yeah. Oh my God. We pink. always think of pink bubble gum, right? Yeah. Bubble pink. So it was pink because that's. The I only want to go color. back to this natural latex thing for a minute. Did you they? Did they identify like what? What is natural? La is it, is that what they call it? Chick that's what I'm calling it. You're calling it like for chiclets? chiclets? Yeah, chickle. Isn't chickle what you used to chew naturally for chewing gum? I don't know. I, I'm going to, you know, now I'm curious. H-I-C-L-E. Isn't it chickle? Maybe. I mean, but the, 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 the concept of the word natural and latex in the same sentence just, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me, but. He never patented the idea. Oh, boy. Double Bubble made, made millions of dollars on it. He said it didn't bother him, though, because he said he had done something with his life and he made kids happy all around the world. And uh, so they said the gum was pink because it was the only food coloring he had at the factory. And um, he then, they said, compared to uh, standard chewing gum, as we said, it was less sticky. They began marketing it as double bubble. And so Deemer's job or Dimer's job was to go around to all these different places to show people how to blow bubbles. <laughs> that was his job? Okay. He had to demonstrate how this double bubble differed from other chewing gums. They sold it for a penny a piece forever. Um, sales surpassed 1.5 million in the first year, and uh, they said it was very a very popular, inexpensive treat during the Great Depression. According to his second wife, he never received any royalty, but he um, was obviously a superstar at the Fleer Company. He oversaw the construction of bubblegum plants in Philadelphia and Barcelona, Spain, and uh, he stayed there for decades until he retired in 1970. Following the death of his first wife, he rode around his Pennsylvania retirement village, village on a big tricycle distributing bubblegum to kids in honor of his wife. He died of congested heart failure in Lancaster, PA on his 94th birthday in 1998. Saturday Night Live um, honored him and said, and they joked that his body was found stuck under a movie theater seat. <laughs> That's a funny little line. Happy birthday, Walter. So Dimer. I'm guessing that... D-I-E-M-E-R. Is that how you'd say Dimer? Yeah, I'd say it that way, yeah. Um, Double Bubble, did it do better, I wonder, than Bazooka? Well, these other ones came out afterwards. Then. I remember Double Bubble being softer. Yeah. I remember Bazooka being so hard, hard. it could break your teeth. Yeah. And it had a comic. It had the comic wrapped around it, that yeah. little thing that our children's eyes could pr see it perfectly. This I need a magnifying glass today. But it was, Double Bubble was the better bubble gum, in my opinion. If we got that, we were happy. And, they had, and Double Bubble also had the, the gum balls. Yes. And yeah. different, different things. And the company's still going. So we got to invent something. <laughs> we're working on it. We're working on it. Is there a candy you can invent, you think? Look! 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 What our friends did with Schnappers. Yeah. Pretzel. Well, I, what was that? Pretzel, chocolate, sea salt, and, car and caramel. And caramel. Light. Yeah. But I wonder. It's you know. I. I. It's like we talked about that pillow guy. How tough is it to make a pillow? Apparently, you just take I think a it's bag all and. Yeah. Well, it's two. Th it's it's a lot of things. It's a lot of things. So hey, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got a couple of uh, shop talks we want to cover with you. One of them is uh, related to. Uh, four goals that will make 2020 your sharpest and healthiest year yet. And then also we're going to cover some TED Talks that uh, were recommended for us to all listen to to uh, get us off on the right foot. So stay with us. We'll be right back. So you want to do the... You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com.
focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host Tim Bennett. Now I'm back. Okay. And during break, Garrett brought us Double Bubble. Double Bubble. And he's che- uh, and you're chewing right now, right? Double Bubble. And indeed, it does look like a piece of taffy. It's just like I remember it as a kid. It's made in Canada now. And Tim says, I love gum. Okay. This is made in Canada. That this particular batch might have been, but they, you said they had a plant near uh, Philadelphia, right? Well, apparently it's been bought by some Illinois company. This one's made in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving along. Thank you, Garrett, for the double bubble. I like this. Uh, we have two quick shop talks for you. Uh, the first one is from Inc. Magazine, and I thought it was interesting because of the goals that they, in fact, chose for this. It's four goals to make 2020 your sharpest, healthiest, and best year yet. We saw a lot of that stuff come out around the end of 2019. And the the article... The author actually kicks off by saying the first resolution alone is worth your entire and full commitment. I could not agree more. So the first first piece of advice out of these four is identify and attack toxicity. The two basic ways to continually weed out more forms of toxicity for health and mental clarity are to set clear boundaries and to replace new habits with old ones. That could also be people. <laughs> I so, don't understand this one so much, but I guess this was just to be... Eliminate bad things. Bad things. Get, get rid of the negative. Toxicity, yeah. Number two is make swaps. Routines are hard to break, but often you can uh, gain drastic physical mood and cognitive benefits simply from tweaking what you already do. Sounds like a Seinfeld episode. Yeah. So it says to uh, find one small boost to give yourself each week. For instance, if you always had you know, toast and jelly, maybe do wheat toast. Exact change the bread. Don't do yeah, and it's but it's small little things that you add up, so? right? Yes, I. If you did if you did one every week, you'd have fifty two. <laughs> fifty two changes, yeah. You think you could do fifty two changes? I was wondering about that. Well, myself. I don't know if I could. It's a really good question, it's a actually. Lot of I guess you do one thing a week. If you said you're not going to eat, but then you have to sit down and really think about it too. Work. You'd be like, I'm going to exchange this for this. I'm going to I'm going to use edamame pasta instead of pasta pasta. And that's one. There you go. That's one week down. In Tim's world. This one, I starred and starred and circled, be a learner and practice. We were talking about uh, your piano possibilities. Um, I can't agree with this more. Uh, Ensuring you learn something each day, however small, gives your brain new data and can shift your perspective and influence both creatively and, in in creativity, sorry, and decision making. I actually read a blog uh, a week. Uh, it's not every week, but it's close to it. One of my old animation mentors named James Chang has a blog called Animated Spirit. I highly recommend it, even if you're not an animation artist or an artist in general. But it's just really wonderfully written, fun, like interesting. You, you stop and you think after you read it. You're like, wow, okay. And it's even something like that. Be a learner. Just read. Yeah, and I, or watch the focus group and listen to TFGM button. You learn something. <laughs> listen, laugh, and learn. Ah, very good. I, I, I put in the notes on this one. Um, don't most people do this? Because it said include in your routine reading articles on, on your commute to work or subway gym or whatever. But I thought generally, don't most people mm. search out or don't do you, don't you read the paper or peruse the paper I each do. day or news? I do. Or, what I've noticed on the subway lately, though, um, maybe it's not lately at all. Maybe this has just been happening. But with the smartphone, it's games, it's music. Really? I still see people reading books, and I still see a lot of people doing Kindle or using their smartphone to read articles. But to me, commuting is perfect reading time. Do you still yeah. use your Kindle? Yeah, yeah, sometimes. it's uh, And I find that to be more, it's more of a book-like experience because you, you only do one thing with Kindle right. you could read. You can't switch away. And, but I, I use my iPad way, way more for reading than the yeah. Kindle, yeah, every day. Number four was get your sleep schedule on track. Everybody talks about this. Make sure that you're, uh, you're getting a good night's sleep could be very healthy for you. I like a TV in my room, although they say cut out electronics at least one hour before bed and also don't have them on in the room because the light will be distracting and overload. That blue light, yeah, it's very toxic. Do you have a TV in your bedroom? No. I have a TV in the bedroom. Not allowed, not allowed. Well, you know we had that whole 
I know. <laughs> so those are four uh, quickies, four goals to, or four ways to set some goals. Identify and attack toxicity, make swaps, be a learner, and practice, and get your sleep schedule on track, and, and get your sleep environment on track, I'll put there as well. Uh, another article we came across, and, and we watched all five of these, and it's going to be curious to see where we landed, but um, I read an article that, that sequestered or pulled together the five best TED Talks. You know, the TED are those really high, high-end talks, usually 20 minutes. Now they've been cut down to 13-ish, 13 or 12. 13. Or 12. Uh, let's do this. The talks are the following. What makes a good life? Lessons from the longest study on happiness by Robert, Robert Waldinger. Inside the mind of a master procrastinator by Tim Urban. How craving attention makes you less creative by the actor Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Or leave it. How to build your confidence and spark it in others by Brittany Packnett. And your elusive creative genius by Elizabeth Gilbert. Now, do you have a favorite out of any of these? Yep. <laughs> well, what was it? I'm not playing the game with you because you, 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 you. I'll like tell you to, mine you like first. Then. No, I'll tell you mine first. Then I'll tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> so my two favorites were "Inside the Mind of a Master Procrastinator" by Tim Urban, and the second one was "How Craving Attention Makes You Less Creative" by Joseph Joseph Gordon Le Levitt. Wow. Levitt. Are yours not even? Those are my two least favorite. Are you are you serious? Yeah, I thought they were horrible. Really? Yeah. I liked the first one, which was "What Makes a Good Life: Lessons from the Longest Study on Happiness," which could have been told in three minutes. I don't even want to go into the procrastinator one. How horrible that was! Which you picked <laughs> the other one. It was how to build confidence. You liked that one. Right. She said the word confidence about 50 times during that talk. I, I only need to hear it once. Okay. Where are my notes? Change the world. Do this. Do that. Right? Inside the mind of a master procrastinator. First of all, you and I are procrastinators. We're the kind of procrastinator. That, so he broke it into, by the way, listeners, he broke this into two categories. People who procrastinate and rush to get something in on a deadline. I believe that's the kind of procrastinators we are. We know we have a paper due, and he used the example of writing a thesis. We have a healthy relationship with the deadline. Yeah, but the other form of procrastination that he discovered was when he did a blog post about this exact thing, about trying to get your stuff done earlier. People would send in or write comments about how procrastinations ruin their life. And what he's, that second part was, I'm not happy or I hate my job, but I just don't have the inertia to get out of it, and waiting and waiting and waiting to change your life, that's a form of procrastination. And that's why I thought it was an interesting contrast between, eh, I'll get it done later, or the typewriter broke, you know, typewriter broke, or you're in an unhappy relationship, you hate your, whatever it is, and you just don't have the momentum to change it. So I like that. Wow. I See, I, well, okay. <laughs> I didn't like that one at all. I thought I was expected something different from. Him. That's the one thing I will say about all five of these, is I think they were too long. They could have made their points quicker, but that's Ted. Um, sometimes I felt like I was getting a a uh, academic lecture, and I also felt that um, I, I left. I was left with a lot of them saying, "What's the point?" And and my point with the procrastinator one, I, I expected to get some sort oh, of... Oh, yes. I, I, what's yes. the point? And so... So he did not give you... So to... You know, you have a great point. I enjoyed him exposing... Story. Two ideas of procrastination. But there was not one itch of a solution in there about how do you make yourself less of a lifetime, like versus the deadline procrastination versus life. You're right. There was no actionable... That's no takeaway. And that's why I like the first one. And I'd seen this one before. So the first one was what makes a good, what makes a good life lessons from the longest study. So apparently back in 1934, Harvard started this study. And uh, of all the people, the 700 people they've started talking to, 60 are still alive. And every year since 1938, 
they go through a series of batteries with these questions from different socioeconomic they areas. They physically visit the right. people, too. And whereas they said they asked the question, what would millennials want to have a successful life? They say fame and Money. fortune, right? Fame and fortune, yeah. But they said that they found a theme here, whether people were wealthy and regardless of education, whatever, that people that were happiest are the ones that had good relationships. Not only with spouses, but with friends. In, in, in overall, in they fact, had good networks and good good. This was one of the best paced um, talks, and I thought it was perfectly timed because when he gets to the crescendo where he says, and guess what? Here's what we found out. Right. The secret to longevity and happiness is relationships. It wasn't about power. It wasn't about career. It wasn't about money. It was about maintaining you know, strong friendships. And, 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 right. and, and not the number of friends, but the quality. The quality of and it, the, yeah. And so I liked that one. The... Um, the other one you liked, how to crave attention. How craving attention makes how you less creative. Craving attention makes you less creative. I thought it had nothing to do with creativity, but all about what's going on with social media. That's well, my, that was my takeaway from So this guy is an actor. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, yeah. He talks about how he started a blog, or he, he was more concerned about getting followers. Which is... Getting likes, rather than... Which is craving attention. Right. As opposed to when he's really happiest he's paying attention so he had this routine where it's like rolling sound light camera action since he's on he said it's that sequence then the minute the director says action he's paying attention to his seat scene partners he's paying attention to what he's doing he's collaborating with his other actors i and i see where you could i see where this one might have been problematic for you i i get that <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I think that was a shot. <laughs> no, not really. But to me, this was subtle. It was probably too subtle. So when people are running around and they're doing posting videos online and they're having and they're trying to get likes and clicks and thumbs up and all that, don't he? His whole basic thought is don't mistake that for creativity. That's just someone pouring crap out to get attention. But they're not. But they're. It's not fulfilling. The fulfilling part for him was paying attention to his world and his, his moment that he was in. Well, I missed that takeaway. Which then would mean that it's not the greatest talk in the world because but, you didn't you didn't walk away with that. But and then the the one that I liked that you didn't confidence? Pick was how to build confidence. And what I like this was an African American teacher. She was and, good. And she did talk about the issue of um being seen, but how confidence is missing from the equation of life. She said, we all have now lots of ability to have resources or knowledge because of how technology is. But they said, particularly in kids, and she had a, an inner city class of kids of color, and she talked about how, whereas they could have resources and knowledge, a lot of times if they did not see people like themselves or that they weren't encouraged, that confidence um, was missing. And she she broke it down to three areas. She said confidence needs permission to exist, community and curiosity was one of them, and, right? Well, community can um, uh, support can support confidence, and curiosity will confirm it. And so I th took too long to get there. Again, I think. <laughs> And we're talking about talks that were 13, 13 to 15 minutes. minutes, yeah. Now I will say the last one neither of you neither of us picked and it was it's known as the greatest what did they say one of the most famous TED talks of all time. You're not kidding. Writer right? Elizabeth Gilbert discusses the precariousness of creativity and suffering being inextricably linked and how artists and their support systems can better manage the emotional risks of creativity. <sighs> And that one was 19 minutes. I thought it was. I thought was I was long. listening to a bad NPR it, it PR piece. And she's the author of Eat, Eat, Pray, Love. Eat, Pray, Love. And it was a long way to go to talk about showing up. I mean, at the end of that, all you have to do in any of these TED talks is go to the last minute, because that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> do you see how this system gets gamed? <laughs> All you have to do. After listening to these five TED Talks, and I'll tell the listeners, we'll post them. Just go to the last minute. That's all you need to do. Last minute sums it up. But she went on to ancient Greece and talking about Romans and talking about all this craziness. All right. So, 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 yeah. Okay. What? Did you like this one? I enjoyed One of the best TED Talks of all time. I'm, I'm not, I don't think I would put it as one of the best. I've seen others that I enjoy far more than, but I do like what she was saying, which is, so she has been a writer all her life. 
she wrote and published, and then they had published Eat, Pray, Love. It became a monster worldwide hit. A yay, we're happy. With but her life after that became, how are you going to do it again? Yeah. How are you going to do it again? How you, are, what's your next book? Are you going to be as big as Eat, Pray, Love? And her whole talk about like how, how we think of creativity and output I don't know. And maybe as a creative director and as someone who fancies himself an artist, or it that wasn't an. Is this one you read? I did read this. I didn't do the. I read the transcript. Watch the it, video. Uh, okay. Because okay. it gets religious too. Because what talks to God a lot. What Tim's talking about is like I had a commute. I was going to go downtown, and I thought I could actually watch some of these on my commute, but I couldn't download it. But I hit the transcript button, yeah. and it's a perfect transcript. So it took quite a while to read this one because 19, 19 minutes, minutes of spoken time means you gotta so it was it, it, but of course I read it with my own internal voice right so it wasn't about I didn't get the, the whole stage thing it was as if somebody said you have to do a thesis on something you gotta fill 20 minutes and that's and she filled it and at the end of the day it was sometimes you just have a job to do and it's important to show up and it's important to show up but that's not really the what I thought the message was anyway <laughs> So, but I think these TED Talks are cool. I like them. I will tell you the two best TED Talks that I've seen recently are done by the same person. And I don't know if you've seen them. You should watch them. Chip Kid. Oh, I love Chip graphic, Kid. The, he's been yeah. on our, he was on our show when we were on Sirius XM and uh, helped Lisa Birnbach with the True Prep book. He does two, which I think are, he, he talks about designing book covers yeah. and the other one talks about um, more simplicity or art around us or something. But both of them, I thought, were so well done and to the point, and, and I should post those as well. These I was surprised. I was surprised. I don't know why we don't come out with our own list of 10 or 5. Maybe we, we should, should do our own list of we TED should. Talks that we think. Because you and I have seen other TED Talks mm -hmm. we like. If you were to do a TED Talk, what would you do it about? Now, that's a great question. And I've been puzzling about that since I watched the five of these, actually. Right. What would it, what would it, uh, you don't know what it would be? No, no. Maybe I'll do what Don suggested. We have Don on the phone from Alabama. And Don, your airport became the first to be cleared for space flight. I love it. I'm coming down to Rocket yep. City. The Huntsville International Airport is, will soon have its name changed to the Huntsville International Airport and Spaceport <laughs> as the first FAA designated airport allow the landing of spacecraft oh don i love this i you guys yeah. are so lucky to have a spaceport next door right let you fly yeah. out of newark yeah. it's 100 100 bucks cheaper <laughs> <laughs> what what um where are you flying but you to? don't get the miles you don't right. get the miles where right you're flying to uh i believe this first designation is probably for blue origin or some of the shuttle-like replacement aircraft that will need a 1.4 mile or greater runway. That's the other thing about the Huntsville International Airport is it has one of the now has one of the longest runways in the country, uh, third only to Groom Lake or what they call Area 51. So you should so, really be our sister city, Don. New York and Huntsville. So you have the longest yeah. runway. We have one of the shortest runways in the at least in the U.S. at LaGuardia. <laughs> We'd be <Yeah>. sister cities. <laughs> That's right. Because I know there's nothing I love more than landing at LaGuardia and holding on tight. <laughs> Where are they? I don't understand where you're flying to. No, uh, low you're Earth orbit. You're flying from. Yeah, yeah, yeah low you're, Earth you're, orbit. Right, but so if yeah. I take off out of Huntsville, am I going to get to go somewhere? No, no. This would be like if you got launched on a space plane from, like, say, Cape Canaveral. Huntsville is actually cleared for a craft for that's landing. a wind, like the old shuttle with the wing, a winged landing, well, and they need that no. length to slow but down. Not only that, but not only that, John. It's also cleared if. If the craft is space bound, you can depart out of Huntsville International Airport yeah, so when they doing. begin to develop reusable aircraft that can runway land, runway takeoff, and runway land. Oh, oh, okay. So that's different. That's sort of like what Virgin Galactic's doing with that yeah. tr that transport thing, and then the pod drops off and goes further. Where yep. are they going? No, Tim. There's nowhere to go. Did the except shuttle do that. The shuttle had to be launched on a rocket piggyback style. So the shuttle couldn't just take off and get up there? Not on its own. It had no, to have a... Not on its own. Yeah. Um, but where is everybody going? They're going... To, this is like space tourism. It's, it's low, low yeah. Earth orbit. It's barely... In fact, I would say there's still a hint of atmosphere up there when, when they're at some of these altitudes. It's, yeah, if you're, a, if you're a purist, it's, it's extremely low, very low Earth orbit. Correct, yeah. 
So, it, like Blue Origin is Jeff Bezos. His uh, yeah. very quiet, very quiet. Not mm -hmm. not like uh, SpaceX and uh, they they built a massive 1.4 million square foot engine plant here in Huntsville that's opening this year. Wow. So, Be see, yeah. Bezos has been developing Blue Origin for a while, and it's it's a ba it's the idea is to use the same device to get you into orbit and to land like SpaceX does. Well, how come we just don't go up, go up and fly higher so we can get there faster? Because you there's no air up there. There's no air uh, pressure for the wings uh, differential for a wing to function. Yeah. So, so if I went up to fifty or sixty thousand feet in an airplane, can it do that? Yes, an airplane can go up to uh, 97,500 feet, plus or minus, depending on atmospheric conditions. So why do we do it? Well, they do because do it. You, they do do it. That's the SR-71 used to fly it. No, I want to fly uh, to L.A. Too. in like an hour from New York. Oh, Tim, want, you know what he wants? To, Get up and over. Down, he wants to go up into orbit High. and then down to, yeah. 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 Now, what, what he wants is the uh, Elon Musk's uh, rocket tubes that will cross the continent in seven and a half hours. Yeah. At 585, or uh, what is it, 985 miles an hour. I had a friend of mine flew a fi fighter jet coast to coast. It's about an hour and a half. Yeah. Th that's and how it should be. Get on the 747, shoot across. The, fast, the, the fastest coast to coast coverage that I recall is two hours and, what, 52 minutes in the SR-71 Blackbird. Well, that's pretty fast. That sure beats that's six hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, there's that whole spacesuit, and uh, don't expect to bring any luggage issues. <laughs> and no iPads allowed, and there's no drinks on nope. that plane. Yep. A little yep. turbulence. Nope. No, I didn't know. But, yeah. I just don't know why we don't fly higher to get there quicker. D Tim is, uh, Tim's got, Tim's got beef, beef with mm -hmm. technology and space. That'd be a good president. And, oh, boy. Oh, As I get in here, I want to go higher and faster, quicker. Well, higher does not equate to faster. Quicker. Higher does not equate to quicker. Okay. You know, a, a ballistic trajectory is not necessarily the fastest, is the shortest distance between two points, even with acceleration. What you want are faster air, what you want is the FAA to clear for supersonic flight. Yes. Which they won't do because of the impacts of, of sonic booms on structures and the ground. But you can get, you know, Boeing has on multiple occasions tried to reprototype a passenger supersonic aircraft that'll Mach 2.5, which will get you from, you know, that gets you from New York to L.A. in four hours. I'd take that, too. I'd take that. And that yep. cares if you make a bang over Nebraska. Because <laughs> you're not it's making not the, the bang over Nebraska. You yeah. make it the bang pretty close to the airport you took off from. Yeah. It's the, air, it's the it's the bang in, in, in Manhattan that takes out the windows of the skyscrapers that people, for some reason, object Yeah, to. Don, psh, psh, like that weird Hancock a building. Clock to LA. <laughs> There's a building that was built in Boston, the Hancock Tower. They didn't do the glass right, and every time the wind would do something, it would pull the windows out, and they would shatter on the church below. Yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah, we want, we want to avoid those kind of things. But like I, say, I know we talked about Huntsville a few weeks ago. I just wanted to add that we now have the designation of being the first commercial spaceport, uh, passenger spaceport aircraft. Well, that's or, great. Uh, airport. You know, in, in many ways, if I weren't so rooted to my current city, it would be almost enough to make me move because I just love the idea of saying to someone, take a left at the spaceport and a right at the red barn. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> And you can literally do both at the Huntsville and International the Huntsville Airport. International Airport and Spaceport. Yeah. Hey, Don, thank you. Uh, Happy Thanks, New guys. Year. Thanks for being a Happy part of New our Year. show and for Thanks, kicking Don. off. And uh, we'll do another Mr. Science class very soon. T Tim learns much. <laughs> I think I'd be a good thank you. Thank you. I Thanks. think I'd be a good president because I would ask the question, and then I get an answer, and then I move on. I would ask the question. I just want to know why we can't go faster. I'm gonna make a boom. I could just see your chief of staff running around the White House right now. Mr. D D the president wants to know why we can't go from L.A. to New York in four hours. I don't know. What do we tell him? Get the head of NASA in here. I mean, I could just imagine it now. Well, you might be. You chief. know what would happen? You might be chief of staff. If you were. You would be the one that has to answer the question. A, and if you were president, you would have Don be your head of NASA. Yeah, Don would be head of NASA. You would get him on the phone and say, Don, what's going on? And then there'd be a PowerPoint deck that would arrive that would show you about the air density and lift. Don, and come on. <laughs> and you and Don would have a sidebar and I'd be bored and I'd go into the Oval Office. Yeah. Hey, thanks for joining us today. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, John. Thanks for Don. Thanks to Billy for joining us on our first show of 2020. Thanks to our boys in the booth, Garrett, Steve, and Robbie Bobby back there. We hope everyone has a uh, good week. Be sure to catch our Tuesday podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned. And uh, remember to uh, don't text or drive, arrive alive. Did I forget something? No. I keep forgetting. I got to thank you, Deep Discount. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.